The Square Ball Podcast. Hello, welcome to the show. It's brought to you in association with Levi Solicitors, who will offer you a 10% discount on your legal fees at levisolicitors.co.uk forward slash the square ball. We're hopping in the DeLorean again. Dan here with Michael and Moscow White, Daniel Chapman, as we uh, we go back to, to 1999, before the millennium, before the millennium bug. Oh, it was bad, that one. It took over. Do you remember Com- the cash points spitting out all that money? The computers all Planes crashed. falling out of the sky. It was awful. It was wild, wasn't it? Um, two games remaining in this season and Arsenal came to Ellen Road on the same points as Manchester United. And this is the square ball guide to Leeds United spoiling Arsenal's fun in 1999. Bit of a weird season. A fun season. But it it ended... It, well, it looked like we might have a title challenge briefly for like a week. And then we managed to lose a few games in quick succession. Then it looked like we might get in the Champions League. But we lost to Chelsea the week before this. So that meant they were pretty much secure of it. So we were stuck in fourth, which was great. Fourth was good. UEFA Cup, as it was at that point. Yeah, it wasn't sexy fourth like it is now. It was, um, it's fine fourth. But then the UEFA Cup was a good competition in those days, so it it wasn't too bad. So there was only one league place for it because it went to the, well, ultimately went to the losers of the FA Cup and the winners of the League Cup in this season. The only uh, downside to the UEFA Cup at this time was the risk that we just were playing Maritimo again. Because that's what seems to happen every time we got into Europe. We would play Maritimo. Um... But it uh, it was still pretty exciting getting into... It was more exciting because we were dead sexy and fun, basically. Yeah, we were on a proper upswing, weren't we? The the early pre-madness um, O'Leary upswing. When the, all, uh, all the babies were coming through. The way it was um, described in this match um, by, I believe, Michael, when we were discussing earlier of the... Um, it's the Puma shirts. It's... Woodgate with his frosted tips. It's Alan Smith in full curtains mode. Um, even, I mean, it's dreadful to say the name now, but Harry Kewell wearing 19 and being looking like the best um, player in Europe at the time was, it was all just like coming together. And then you've got sort of future sexy leads there, but still David Hopkin. Yeah, and Alfie <laughs> Harland. Get, and Alfie <laughs> Harland playing right back in this one. Yeah, and David Batty as well, who's not a... The only time he was associated, do you remember when... Um, Channel 5 tried to, did the sexy football advert with him because he was playing for Rude Hullets Newcastle and yeah, they had yeah. the rights to their UEFA Cup games were on Channel 5. So they did a photo. They took the top half of David Batty's body wearing a Newcastle shirt and the bottom half was a lady's legs in stockings and suspenders. And they advertised it as sexy football on Channel 5. And How do you uh, know they weren't Batty's legs? Uh, he he didn't recognise them. He did think it was a laugh, though. He was all He thought it was great fun. Um, although I think it got criticism at the time. I did enjoy this season because we routinely got attendances over 40,000 inside Ellen Road, which always felt like an exciting Mm. threshold to cross. And for this one, we got 40,124. 11th of May, 1999, this one. I was, what, I think I was two to three weeks out from finishing my university course and having my final exam. I was at school for this one, but it was um, it was a great game. I was, I've enjoyed this season as a whole, and I kind of enjoyed looking back at how weird it was because I feel like you don't get seasons like this anymore. When you look back at Christmas and Aston Villa atop under John Gregory and future Leeds legend Julian Jochum was getting a few goals from future um, TV presenter extraordinaire Dion Dublin was in was doing well from, and despite being preseason favourites, Man United and Arsenal was sort of there or thereabouts, but. Neither had started the season particularly well. Arsenal were behind us at that point. We were fifth, they were sixth. Middlesbrough up in fourth. And that's I think that's what you're getting at, is that pre-season, a team you don't fancy, sort of having a, an early season surge, being top around Christmas. Whereas now it's just Man City go top and stay there. Mm. Whereas we, it used to be a bit of a variety. Even you'd be looking at Wimbledon in eighth and thinking, well, could they get into Europe with their minus six goal difference? <laughs> From 18 games. And they both went on pretty mad runs sort of Christmas onwards, didn't they? Arsenal and uh, Man United. Yeah, they didn't. They just didn't lose from that point on, having having had a bit of a, a shaky start. I mean, Arsenal, as a weird little George Graham tribute, drew three of their opening four games nil-nil, which is an odd way to mount a title challenge. But, I mean, the defensive solidity did stay throughout the season. They conceded, well, I've got a table here, but I think by the time they came to Ellen Road, they had conceded... 16 goals. Yeah, that's not very many. Having played 36 games. Wow. The next so best, they were tight. The next best defence at that point was Chelsea had conceded 29, 
which even my math, that's almost twice as many. <laughs> but uh, it tells you something unfortunate about Scum's attackers, that their goal difference uh, was exactly the same as Arsenal. So they conceded 20 more goals, but had scored 20 more goals. Ah, sickening. And Aston Villa's title challenge didn't last too no, long. They're they, behind us now. Yeah, they went to they went to Everton on January the 18th and won, but then they didn't win again until April the 10th, which mm. is a long time. That is a long time. So they, they plummeted. Which and, in contrast with Arsenal, who played, what, 21 games from just before Christmas, only drew three and lost one, which was this one. Yeah, I mean, them and Scum just didn't lose games at all. And then they and they, they even went to, a, this is the season, they went to a replay against each other in a cup. Was and, that Villa Park, the gigs goal? Yeah, yeah. Horrible, awful scenes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, nobody needs that, do they? No. Um, anyway... David O'Leary was uh, was stoking the flames before this one, well, need, this, needlessly. It was all coming to, uh, because this is the penultimate game of the season, so lose, and given that neither team is losing whatsoever, if Arsenal lose to us, um, handing the title to scum on a plate, and the, the, the other subplot is obviously David O'Leary being a former Arsenal uh, centre-half, and I only imagine, and I look back at his um, pre-match interviews, and I do wonder who the hell he thought he was, um, because the, the the big headline on the back of the mirror was Wenger will leave Arsenal in the C star star P because you can't you can't write <laughs> what you say co op co op yeah because you uh, you can't write the word crap on the back of a tabloid newspaper um, yeah when he said uh, um, Arsene is a very clever man and the question then will be whether he will stay around or leave some other poor bloke to clear up all the crap when his defence retires. It would not surprise me if he left. So O'Leary's theory was that Adams, Keown, Seaman, Winterburn, Dixon and Bold have been the backbone of Arsenal for years and they are basically the reason why they've only conceded 16 goals and the reason why they might be winning the league. Um, Wenger uh, has had very little to do with it, therefore... And uh, the continental way, says O'Leary, has always been to come in, do a job and get out while the going's good. And I'm sure he recognises how lucky he was to inherit that Arsenal defence. It's a team within a team. Um, and he said, where's the other bit? Um, he basically says it wouldn't surprise him if, uh, uh, yes, I'm not sure Arsene will still be at Arsenal in three years' time. And if he leaves, <laughs> it will be interesting to see whether the rest of the French lads will leave too. So he's really gone in for one, uh, all the successes down to George Graham's uh, defenders. Wenger has been lucky to inherit them and he'll probably just stick around for a couple of years and then him and all the French lads will fuck off because that's what the continental way is. So it's really like bang, 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 shots fired, eve of the match, uh, big headlines on the back of the... Uh, Daily Mirror, just the way I suspect he wanted it. Inside as well, there was uh, Tony Adams with the headline saying, O'Leary was just like a father to me. Now he stands in the way of our title. And uh, yeah, full double-page preview, key battle, Radaby versus Burkamp, Bowyer versus Petit, all the predicted lineups, photos of Tony Adams and David O'Leary together when they were playing for Arsenal. All big, big um, pre-match stuff and all... Uh, live on Sky, so everybody's excited about it. Tuesday and, uh, night under the lights, Moscow. Elland Road is rarely, probably rarely been better than uh, Tuesday nights under the lights in the first sort of 10 years of the Premier League. For, for our generation, I suppose, you always remember your own um, generation the best. But even I was watching this in a pub, but even the fact it's Elland Road under the floodlights on Tuesday night gave it that extra little dimension of and if we were, if we were playing married team oh, there probably would have been like 30,000 people and it would have been great oh well, there is shit talking pre-game as well this isn't Wenger's first season he's not just arrived and not done anything he won a double the year before <laughs> oh so he was lucky though he's won, he's won the double he's he got, got them he inherited Steve Bold on the verge of another league title which they'd not won since well prior to his arrival they'd not won one for quite a while had they it was, it was George Graham era so they'd, yeah. had a, they'd had quite a few barren years in the middle of it he was no Bruce Rioch. And he was just like, nah, he's done nothing. <laughs> done nothing, this bloke. Well, I mean, there's sort of a point about the defence because it is extraordinary to look at a team that has Dennis Burkamp and Nicholas and Elker at one end and then Martin Keown and Steve Bold at the other. And But that's it's not that 
um, Wenger just sat back and let that happen. He managed to create a team with these two completely different parts and make it all work brilliantly together. Probably um, Petit in midfield with uh, Patrick Vieira would probably because they were good, good uh, let's do, let's ball do, players. Let's do the lineup. Because... Also, I'll just go, let's say they've got the real kind of um, the the hardness that comes from. Uh, Keown, and I don't just mean to so look at him. It was the archetypal Arsenal defence. You had Seaman in goal, Dixon, Adams, Winter, Burning, Keown. And then in midfield, Petit, Vieira, Overmars and Parler with an Elker and Burkamp up front. Um, subs who featured in the game. Uh, Nelson Vivas, uh, Kaba Diawara and Kanu all came on in this. I mean, that is a bloody strong Arsenal side, isn't it? I mean, the archetypal Wenger side in many ways. I mean, Patrick Vieira is brilliant in this game. He's probably the the best midfielder on the pitch. He just he just does a few little things, and he was the he was the new kind of archetype for a midfielder, wasn't he? As well, everyone at the time went, well, every midfielder is just going to have to be Patrick Vieira from now on because he's really big and he's fairly quick, but he's still got a really good touch, but he still can tackle and he can head it. It was like this was ahead of the Barcelona team where it changed to actually no midfielders could be small again. Everyone went, well, everyone needs big midfielders. And we ended That's up saying... the way we're going to have to do it. Oli Decor, who was kind of in that mould, he wasn't quite as gangly as, mm. as Vieira was, but he had the same skill set, didn't he? Stephen McPhail absolutely betrayed by this era of football. <laughs> He'd been born a little bit earlier, so he, he would have been fine in the Premier League, or a little bit later, mm. so he could have played for Barcelona. But just in this era when it was all Vieira and Keane. But we weren't half bad, you know. Um, for Leeds, Nigel Martin in goal, ofs. Uh, defenders, you got Woodgate and Radabay at the back with Harlem playing right back, as you mentioned, and Ian Hart at left back. Uh, Boya, Kewell, Batty and Hopkin in the midfield with Jimmy and Alan Smith up front, Jimmy Hasselbank um, completing the lineup. The other um, thing that makes this a classic Leeds team is it's super sneery Hasselbank era. <laughs> Every time the camera cuts to him, he yeah. looks cross about some Furious, wasn't he? A furious man. This was the season when he celebrated every goal by trying to fight his teammates, wasn't it? <laughs> like his first year, he'd done somersaults and then for some reason, season two, um, yeah, he just looked really angry all the time. And it was when Ian Hart scored a free kick and he ran up and just punched him. <laughs> it's one of the great moments. <laughs> Would you of, say uh, he was Hasselbank. living La Vida Loca, perhaps? Why? That was, number, the era. that was number one in the charts. Oh, okay, Number one in the charts in America, Ricky Martin, and you got Backstreet Boys. I want it that way in the UK charts. You see, when I was researching this, I noticed that this game pretty much coincided with Katie Hill announcing that she was going to leave Blue Peter. But I sensibly decided that wasn't <laughs> going to be worth shoehorning in. Because uh, what's-his-face had uh, been sacked for his cocaine binge and everybody was Bacon. leaving because of that. Yeah, there was only Connie Hoop John left. Noakes. <laughs> just, just needlessly lumping him in with some drug use. No, it was Richard Bacon. It was uh, Shep. <laughs> was Shep face down in a, a bucket of... of snow. <laughs> anyway. It's a cocaine smoking dog. Right, anyway. Down, um, Shep, down. So we've announced those teams. We've had Ricky Martin over the PA system. And then yeah, everybody's like, oh, do you think Katie Hill's going to be on a Friday? <laughs> 40,124. Yeah, and they t the bastards turn us around, so we're playing towards the cop first half, which we don't like, do we? Though it would have been amazing if Batty's early strike goes in in front of the cop. Because mm. he never scored for us, did he, in his second spell, which was a shame. I've... Will he stop trying out well, of spite? There was that, yeah. But I've <laughs> because, never... everybody, because every time he got the ball from distance, the Leeds fans started shouting at him, shoot! <laughs> and he got annoyed about it, so deliberately stopped shooting. Yeah. Love him. <laughs> One of my regrets, though, I never got to see a David Batty goal in the flesh. Oh, I saw... I Didn't saw see the, any of his, of his first spell. I saw the one at Man City, at Man City. <sighs> like the OG one. I was there for that. But this this could have been great. It's the uh, first couple of minutes. And, I mean, Hopkin... We're going to give Hopkin credit for setting it up by hitting an absolutely abysmal shot. <laughs> the kind of deflector. Hopkin's shot is going to trickle about 10 yards wide. But it, it rebounds up and Batty hits it on the volley for about 30 yards. And it's... It's close. One of those moments. It's not, yeah. it's not very close, but it's it's David Batty close. The thing, I mean, he scores a couple of good goals for Blackburn in Newcastle and the the one for us against Notts County that stands out. And everybody was talked about shooting in training. I think he could have scored 20 a season if he wanted. It just couldn't be asked. Just couldn't, nah. Could not like be asked. Striker's job, innit? Why is he, why is he going to do their job for them? There's some other fun kind of things to pick out from this game. Um, beyond Hasselbank being furious with just about everything. Corners, still terrible, which is refreshingly on brand. Yep, a couple of plays have a go at it. Same result, headed out the near post. Um, some Arsenal needle, you can stick your George Graham up your ass. some of that. 
being sung by the crowd and within half an hour we're all laying passes which is it's always got I said, talking about living la vida loca that kind of carnival end of season feel when nothing really is on the line for us there's a mexican wave in the second half as well which is takes me by surprise because it's nil nil at, at that point as well it's not even when we're in the lead in the last few minutes and you the ball's just down in the corner sort of northeast corner and you can see a mexican wave going around we had, uh, when was the last time we had a mexican wave at ellen road this the case game is it it go, should we get there would have been a Radebeast testimony oh, the, sure. there, there was yeah. a point at which they were going to rename it the Leeds Leaps such was its prevalence mm. at Ellen Road do you remember that do you yeah. remember that yeah they were saying never mind calling it a Mexican wave it should be renamed the Leeds Leap you used to get a boozy around to the west stand because they didn't do it sometimes yeah. I think that that kind of and the old lays kind of cuts to the core of what this game was all about because all the build up from outside was do Leeds want to hand the Premier League title to their biggest rivals from over the Pennines. How are they going to play it? Are they going to throw the game? There was even like Arsenal fans thinking that's going to happen, that they'll deliberately, um, uh, or no, Scum fans thinking that's what's going to happen, that we'll deliberately lose because it's O'Leary used to play for Arsenal, he'll want them to win. But then it all got a bit confused with O'Leary d- doing his pre-match press and slagging off Wenger because basically you would love Alex Ferguson. Um, but once the game started, one, we just didn't care. And I think that's what people completely missed is the anarchic sides of Leeds fans. He's like, are they going to try and, is it going to be a big chess game? Are you like, suggesting people aren't aware that we're quite anarchic? <laughs> um, I think it takes them by surprise sometimes because that's all the pretty much, is it going to be like this complicated chess game, this strategy of who do they want to win? And on the night, we just wanted to beat Arsenal because it would be funny because they were there and we'd be able to watch them actually cry. And um, the other thing that then, built up was the way that Arsenal, uh, Vieira and Petit being brilliant players, but real, like they had attitude with them as well of being real narky bastards. And then Keon, Adams, Winterburn, Dixon, all being raging knobheads as well. <laughs> Just meant that everything else faded away and what mattered was um, having a real big party at Arsenal's expense. Which is which is what it turned into. How did it unfold then? Michael. Well, Martin Keown gets injured. That's the first thing to talk about. That's that's Hasselbank picking up his, one of his classic bookings. I'm sure he did this most weeks. He'd, a decision to go against him. I think at this point he's calling for a handball or something on the halfway yeah, line. Yeah. But then he just he just set off like a bull, and you just think, no, he whinged first. Yellow card incoming. He spent a while whinging, and then as play went on, he was like, right, I'm going to go and kick. You. I'm just going to go fuck someone up. He used to <laughs> I'm sure, he used to do this all the time. I'm sure. And I think because of the era, you didn't always get booked for it. But every game he'd do this. You leave one on someone. You just you just see a decision go against him, then you go right. Count down from about ten seconds here. Yeah. There's a booking, and surely enough, if he could catch someone, catch up with someone, he did. It's and quite he, a, quite a fiery attack, isn't it? Him and Alan Smith. Just thinking about the two of them mm. together there. But it's a it's a good value booking. Yeah, this one. I love it. It took two. Uh, there's two bites. So he goes for Keon, who so I think he's decided to take his marker out, and he's down and he's injured for a while. So there's some treatment. Um, but then he carries on and then he goes down again and that's when you get the close-up of mm-hmm. his leg and you realise that there's a huge bleeding gash and I don't know if the um, Arsenal physio like second time coming out like, oh that leg <laughs> oh <laughs> didn't oh, didn't realise that's what you were talking about oh I was looking at his leg Cause how did you miss the fact that there is blood pouring out of his uh, wound just above his ankle it's got him right behind the shin pad it's great uh, precision <laughs> from Hasselbank but how they, they didn't seem to pay it much mind the first time around they've not put a plaster on it or anything and then he goes down again after five minutes oh, sorry Martin I wasn't looking at that dirty Arsenal bastards anyway they gave us a penalty didn't they I mean that was Keown again and I mean before that there's Martin makes a couple of decent saves doesn't he in this he's making good saves all through this game is yeah. Martin actually we give him a lot to do as well this is just what Martin was like at this point and this was during the Martin Dave Seaman who's the best goalkeeper and clearly no, it was Martin but the safe because of from, bias uh, the save from Anelka in this game is brilliant because mm. it's uh, it rebounds to Anelka inside the penalty area and he takes it way earlier than you'd expect mm. from much closer range and he tips it over the, the bar stops his folly and it's outstanding and then it's as good as when um, late in the game he runs out to uh, stop a ball over the top that um, I think Haaland is not going to get back to and he clears it towards Hart and mm-hmm. Hart just kicks it straight back at him so he has to clear it again <laughs> and he runs off laughing but I feel like that's what we were doing the whole game is just like making Nigel Martin's life really difficult and him just pulling off a brilliant save and going alright I'm really like that's that's a lot of fun and I'm having a great time but maybe if you could not 
do all this, <laughs> I would prefer it. Seaman does make one decent save in fairness to him from Kewell from about 30 yards. It's actually, it's kind of a little bit like Kewell's goal against Roma. Yeah. But this one gets put behind for a corner. The replay, it's going absolutely plumb in the top corner, mm. isn't it? So what happened with the penalty then? Martin Kewell absolutely destroys Alan Smith and then moans about it. It's an awful tackle. He doesn't even get booked for it. I mean, this is, this is probably a red card these days it's and not. then he stands up and you see a close to his face going I got the ball yeah you can't believe any, that there's any prospect of a penalty he's about five yards away from the ball <laughs> it's described two. described in the in the BBC report as a reckless lunge he's got two footed through it's Alan like Smith's legs on Alan Smith with the ball nowhere near but he's he's furious it's given isn't he I can't believe how upset he is by Just this. Looking at the um, the photos here on uh, on the BBC report reminds me that of course Arsenal were in their home kit. They normally wear their away kit at Leeds because there's quite a lot of white, albeit not a complete clash. But I was very excited by the fact that they wore their home kit for this game. It felt exciting. Never even considered that. But yeah, you're right. But um, yeah, so we've won this penalty, and then Ian Hart goes for straight down the middle with power, but underside of the bar, and then back to Hasselbank. And he hits it straight at Seaman, who's still on the floor, pretty much. Damn. That was the big chance, wasn't it? Yeah, well, into the second half, we should probably have, to, have had another one now. Smith, not even probably. <laughs> Smith, Smith threw it, and this time it's Adams. Yeah, another awful tackle. Smith, into the second half, Smith's coming into this game and starting to really annoy people as well, which is good. He's Adams is trying his best to boot him about the place, and Smith, in the, his sort of attitude at this point with his floppy hair, was just to get up and sort of smile in people's faces yeah, and then boot them a bit later on. <laughs> so, but yeah, this is definitely another penalty. Mm. He, Smith goes through on goal and Adams comes, comes across, gets nothing of the ball no, and quite a lot of Smith. But I think probably having Keown shout in his face for the first one, the ref probably thinks, ah, oh, no, not this time. Not worth it. He completely clears him out. It's hilarious. And uh, Smith goes flying. The ball, there's absolutely no question of contact on the ball. But Alan Smith is flying through the air and the referees sign up. Good tackle. I mean, you, you can contrast that with um, Alfie Harland, who is hard done to when he accidentally knees Winterburn in the nose. It's a Leeds free kick. <laughs> Which is... And yeah, fairness, Alfie is not hard done to whatsoever. <laughs> Alfie is living his best life. In fairness, it is a foul because Nigel Winterburn takes... Alfie out by getting his knee, nose onto his knee, which is a very sly way of doing things. Yeah. And there's a great moment when you watch on the replay as Alfie is uh, blundering sort of through him. He throws, one, Winterburn throws his hands up in front of his face because he can see this knee about to just smash him straight in the middle, but it's too late. And then as he lays on the pitch with blood absolutely pissing out of his face, Harlan just comes up behind yeah. him and picks him up. Yeah, let's get him And up. he's like, it, Winterburn's clearly like, no, put me down. Yeah, he's always stretching my, off. My isn't face he? is completely, completely in bits here. On, on comes uh, Nelson Viva. So he's actually, let's let's jump ahead near now to the, the crucial moment that everyone remembers. Well, I, I like I like it with the, um, the medical team because well, you know it's a bad one because both medical teams are on oh, right, and okay. someone even brings on a little silver suitcase at some point which I'm not sure what it, I don't think that's like the screen to have him put down or something yeah. it's just it's got the lethal injection <laughs> in there they decide it's, it's got the special drugs it's, it's too much but yeah that, I've never seen that before and Vivas comes on but he's he's involved in the, the goal that wins us the game ultimately but Batty shoots just over seconds before this goal happens And but what a glorious moment five minutes from the end yeah I mean the Batty one it's a bit like the one against us the other week where a goalkeeper clears the ball and it goes to someone who just hits it yeah. early in, over, the, over the top. Except again with Batty, he controls the kick out with his left foot and then shoots. It's a beautiful chip with his left foot and you think, just do that all the time, David. It's not even his good foot, it's his left foot and he's just like Pele trying to lob the England goalkeeper into the top corner. He's got him scrambling and it goes inches wide. David, just do this all the time it would be great like, no. but a, a game that was like two heavyweight boxers slugging it out and we finally landed the blow that, that ended the contest just a few minutes from the end and it was kind of uh, I don't know the embodiment of that freewheeling attitude that Leeds could go into this game with because Arsenal had it all on the line Leeds it didn't really matter what happened if we lost as, as a fan base we'd have been like ah well it means Still that, fourth. yeah and it means that Scum don't win the title yep. but to do this was just great fun the, I, de I definitely went into this kind of hoping we'd lose but then when this went in, just went, yeah. Ah. <laughs> it's because when, you could, when you're when you in it for 90 minutes and you're concentrating on the game, you're not really thinking about Alex Ferguson and mm. Teddy Sheringham and fucking all the scum fans. You know, they kind of, it fades to the background because you've got Martin Keown 
slight like smashing through Alan Smith's legs and then turns to the referee and going, I got the ball, I got the ball, what's up? What are you giving that for? <laughs> and 90 minutes of them trying to fight Alan Smith and all that kind of stuff. And at the end, it's like, forget what's happening outside this stadium. It's you lot that we want to see lose. And we did. And their fans after the goal uh, were looking very sad. But the and goal it's... itself, I mean, what a glorious moment. I mean, maybe O'Leary was right about once that defence goes, mm. he's going to be screwed. Because yeah, it's a nice crossover. It's hard, isn't it, on the left? Puts a, a ball into the far post. Nelson Vivas, who in fairness wasn't a left back, was he? I think he was a right back, uh, more typically for Arsenal. Sometimes played him defensive midfield, so he's, he's on out of position. But little tiny Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank sneaks in behind him, doesn't he? With his, his little delicate footsteps and just does a it get ni- nice close range diving header. I mean, you want to be fair to Nelson Vivas in the post match. Um, Arsene Wenger said that uh, it was a it was a huge tactical mistake at the far post. Was his bitterly disappointed description of the Leeds winner, and one of the journalists said, "By Vivas, yes," was the crushing <laughs> reply. Mm. So there was absolutely no question of protecting uh, Nelson Vivas at that point. It was just like, "Yep, it was his fault. He's to blame. He's the one." Uh, but actually, it was a great header by Hasselbank and his last goal for Leeds. His final act as a Leeds player. Apart from that pre-season friendly when everybody I was at Celtic, him. at Celtic. Yeah. I, I was at that as well. Yeah. Um, he may have... Is that the only one he played that pre-season? Was, I think so, yeah. He was we, hanging around in pre-season far too long, We were he? in the Lazio kit, if I remember yeah. right. And we, we actually won up at Celtic, didn't we? But So it was worth it to get photos of him in the Lazio kit because that looked great. Um, but, yeah. It's a bit like the lesser spotted photos of... Uh, um, Rob Molinar wearing the yellow strong bucket, but that's another subject. So we handed the title to Scum. It's funny how the stars are all aligned around this. Jimmy's off to uh, Atletico Madrid, that summer top scorer in the Premier League with 18 alongside Owen and York. Um, and then they went to Blackburn, did the scumbags the day after this, drew nil nil. I mean, so- Blackburn were crap as well. So it was one mm. of those ones that you think, if, 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 only, if only we'd not won this, Apple <laughs> probably, probably would have won the title. There was the other... Um, uh, subplot as well was about um, scum relegating Brian Kidd's mm. Blackburn because he had yet to come and uh, stink our club out, mm. but was uh, was on his way. I was also going to say um, from the match, um, Woodgate stands out because we talked about them having Burkamp and a Nelka up front. He, the way he just blocked Burkamp all night, you look at Woodgate in this game and you just think, how did he not win 200 caps and all the World Cups? and lead us to Champions League glory because he's absolutely immense. By having it. knees made of candy fruits. And uh, uh, I think the spending two years crying because he's been uh, implicated in the court case didn't help either. But there's so much um, talent on display in our team and you can see where it just needed. You just need a better right back than Haaland. But we, got, we had Kelly and you just need... Uh, and we did the upgrade from... Uh, Hopkin eventually you get the core in there and you just yeah and obviously Hasselbank going meant we had to go and find Viduka eventually but there's so much good stuff in there it's a little bit um yeah there's I thought Woodgate was immense in this um, Hasselbank was good as well I have to say some of oh, his brilliant some of it? his game in this I'd, I'd almost forgotten about some of it is a little bit Willie Nonto in a way and that he, when he pulls into wide areas and puts mm. crosses in like he d- almost doesn't do anything fancy with his crosses, but just there are a couple that he puts right in dangerous areas where you just sort of begging for someone to get in the end of him. He hit, and he hit uh, it dead hard, did uh, Jimmy Jimmy Hassel. He like. did, which is what what uh, Willie likes to do as well, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Likes to kick it dead hard. This is a, it is a little bit like O'Leary trying to sign every striker in the world, but I do wonder what um, a partnership of Viduka and Hasselbank might have looked like. Did they play together at Middlesbrough in the end? The classic big man, big man. <laughs> yeah, did they get together at Borough? Maybe I can't remember. conversation for another day, but yeah. the 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 denouement here was that we essentially handed Scum the treble by doing well, this. They'd have done it anyway. So they beat Newcastle in the FA Cup final, and then Bayern Munich in the Champions League final, which is obviously tiresome. Um, any regrets about allowing this to happen? Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, there's no good so... results. Like if, <laughs> if Bayern Munich had won the Champions League, it's just another fraudulent star to stick on their their. Badge mm. of theft, isn't it? And anyway, we went to Coventry on the final day of the season and drew 2-2, two, two, and that's the real quiz. Yeah, that's where the, the real action was. Clyde Vinard with the goal there. There we go. And that is the TSB guide to at Leeds United ruining Arsenal's fun in 1999. We'll see you soon. The Square Ball Podcast.